Uh, so uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is sort of the order that we're going to go through today. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, each resident will get a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'll hand over to them to share their screen and share their work. They'll speak for around eight minutes. Please fill those eight minutes with questions uh, in the chat box. Don't worry about Q&A, et cetera. And this is quite an informal uh, version of Zoom that we're using. And so please uh, ask any questions that you have as you go. And I will field questions to uh, the residents unless we have loads and oodles of time, in which case I might point at you to ask your question yourself and unmute yourself. Again, um, in the usual ways, uh, please keep yourself muted to make sure that you can hear everything the residents have to share. Uh, and that is it, I think, from me. So. The first resident who I'm going to introduce uh, is Elvia, um, and I'm going to do this super inelegantly, but Elvia is a design researcher, wannabe activist, compulsive drawer and dressmaker. She's currently investigating the politics of participation and accessibility as part of her PhD at the Technical University of Eindhoven. So Elvia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex, and hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. I am just going to um, share a video, which will be my presentation, and hopefully this will work for everyone. Hello, my name is Elvia, and my response to the Low Carbon Design Institute residency comes in the form of a commitment to sustained engagement with local community-led initiatives as a way of exploring climate justice. Practically, this has translated into a hand-drawn mapping initiative of community food-related projects in Portugal. This initiative sets out to sketch the relational ecologies of food cooperatives with the communities themselves. In doing so, the hand-drawn maps reflect and prioritize the understandings and stories that are important to the communities right now, thus defining their purpose. In other words, the stories told in these sketches and what they're used for emerge from the communities themselves and thus become of use to the realities from, from where they're coming from. As I'm speaking, I'm showing some hand-drawn sketches on transparent paper, layered against a number of colorful backgrounds. Sketching is part of my practice. I use it as a tool for knowledge building and sharing. Then together and over time, these sketches are a way of collective wayfinding. In the 25 days of the residency, I documented the talks, the resident discussions, and I also interviewed most residents. At the end, I structured my response through them and used them to conduct my response in real life. My response is contextualized within the space created in Lochte for regular and ongoing discussion about climate change in the context of each resident's creative practice. A per of particular relevance to my practice is the focus on locality and community organizing as a way to navigate climate change, thus framing it as a political issue and pushing the conversation towards climate justice. From the experience of going through the residency, I have distilled three points of attention that speak, that speak to my existing creative practice and have also provided me with a clear direction for my final response. First, a commitment to local and sustained action. Second, attention to what already exists. And third, in real life, face-to-face -face and on paper. By far the most important point that Lochte crystallized for me is that although climate change is a global and systemic issue, it requires local ownership in the shape of community-led work. From the projects that were shared during Lochte, I have found most inspiration in the ones that focused on the resources we can share and ways of doing that at a local scale. To create and sustain these shared economies, it is necessary to create structures of community ownership, governance and accountability. 
One of the main collective reflection points in Lokti was around our responsibility as designers, in the broadest sense of the word, to stop producing new things and focus our attention on caring for the things that already exist. In my own practice, this means starting with the spaces, the platforms, movements, initiatives, etc. that already exist or have existed, instead of creating a new proposition from scratch. This allows me to position my interventions as a layer of attention on the works of others. More broadly, this also speaks to the importance of understanding our work as part of a historical continuing, continuum, allowing us to honor past work, to pay attention to what already exists, and finally to consider the legacy that will continue to sustain these communities after we are gone. The third point is to prioritize in real life action. Using Maria Puy Villabella Casa's words, thinking in the world involves acknowledging our own involvements in perpetuating dominant values rather than retreating into the secure position of an enlightened outsider who knows better. For me, prioritizing in real life action means going to where these communities are, having the conversations to understand what's happening, what needs to be done and how we can contribute. I use sketches as a tool to have conversations. Drawing on paper is an immediate and lo-fi way of exchanging knowledge, creating common ground and coming out of a conversation with a shared understanding of things. Putting things to paper brings clarity, generates discussion and brings more voices to the table. It's also a way of formalizing perspectives and stories. Prioritizing in real life action also speaks to a broader point that has been very present throughout Lochte. Design cannot and does not exist in a vacuum. It needs to engage with the multiple dimensions of how climate change manifests in the realities of people. This sometimes leads to less creative places, like tax and legislation, but as part of the fabric of everyday life, these are things that we have to engage with if we want to work towards meaningful change. From everything I have experienced during Lochte, what really stuck with me was this itch to get out of the house, away from my computer and do something in real life with the communities near me. After searching online, it became apparent that finding community-led projects near me was difficult. Websites were poor at best, non-existing at worst. This provided a starting point for action, to map community-led projects within a 25 kilometer radius from me, together with the communities themselves. The Rizoma Cooperative was the first initiative that I engaged with because, as luck would have it, they were running an introductory session on week three of Lochte. I attended the session and afterwards had a conversation with one of the organizing members. In our conversation, we used the sketches I produced during the introductory se session to create a shared understanding of what I meant by sketching the relational aspects of cooperatives. We then added on to those sketches and created new ones, mapping relational ecosystems, thoughts and needs. What emerged from this conversation was that they also haven't found it easy to understand who all the other food-related cooperatives in the country are. Having access to this information is related to one of their long-term objectives of creating a collaborative network between co-ops. Another insight that emerged relating to difficulties with accessing information was around the basic steps that it takes to set up a cooperative. This is not an easy process and there is little support. Documenting this kind of knowledge could help other people interested in starting their own community-led pr project. As part of my commitment to local and sustained action, I have joined Rizoma as a member. I will be working three hours per month in their shop and have also joined the governance working group with the aim of understanding how I can contribute to the specific aim of creating a collaborative network between co-ops and further develop the mapping initiative. My aim is to continue the journey initiated in Lochte, focusing on relational ecologies and by this I mean relationships of knowledge based on food, care and practical labor. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Elvia. Um, questions for Elvia and her project uh, in the chat. You've got a handful of minutes. I'm uh, just going to maybe put Dan on the spot uh, to see if uh, you wanted to ask that question or you had uh, reformulated that question in light of Elvia's presentation at all. Alex, um, well, thanks, Elvia, for the uh, yeah presentation. I, I thought I, yeah, I really like I really like the way you explained it all. I think it was. I suppose maybe a simple version of the question is like, does the material quality of the way that you did this with the layers and the kind of annotations and how much does that relate to the sort of issues themselves or the things that are discussed? Like, is it, do they relate to each other? I mean, obviously they do, but like how, I guess. Um, I, I hadn't thought about, yeah, how the layering relates to the topics, but I guess, yes, they, they, they do relate. When I was, I was trying to, I was experimenting, experimenting with the layer so that I, I kind of, I embody the way that I think and the way that I map it so that, you know, I first put something here and then the second layer, I put something there. But I think that, yeah, it definitely, it connects to the way that we have been wayfinding and navigating our the, the kind of the knowledge and the layers uh, around climate change, um, but yeah, that's something that I can actually uh, further further explore. Thanks. 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 Um, I'm gonna uh, also put Damon on the spot uh, just because uh, you've uh, asked a question, Damon. I'm sure you won't be shy about asking it yourself. I'm terribly shy. You know me, Alex. Um, hi, yeah, that was really good. Thank you. And I wish I could draw like that as well. Um, I'm involved in some stuff here in, in uh, London, uh, the transition town, for example. And transition town has been trying to make things work locally, nationally, internationally, and so on. And it very much depends on the individuals involved. At the moment, I'm probably one of about three active members at all in our local transition town. So it does, it's not like you can put together some sort of very clever piece of legislation or legalese or paperwork shall make it work. It's the individuals. So that can be a good thing because if you've got individuals who are committed, they'll make it work, whatever happens, or it can be bad because if they're ill or they lose interest, it all falls apart. Have you got to that stage of thinking about it yet? Is this too early to ask the question? Uh, well, I think one of one of the things that I'm trying to do by having joined this cooperative is to engage in how they have been doing or dealing with these challenges themselves uh, without, you know, me having to set up a different initiative. And one thing that they did mention, which might be in some way related to what you're saying is, you know, there's... Uh, it's quite difficult to get people to do the actual work um, that you need to do to be a member of it. And yeah, if people fall ill, then you know, it all it all falls apart. So that's that's an ongoing challenge that they have. Um, so I haven't I haven't gotten to, you know, engaging with how they or any other cooperative have, you know, solved that. But I guess you know they, I'll, I'll find out. Yeah, yeah, it'll be fun, right? And 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 you can't do it by waving a magic wand. It's a, it's an ongoing thing, I think. Yeah, I, I I imagine that in most cases these are, I guess, just constant and ongoing things that you have to just continue finding strategies to solve them as they come and just continue doing that work, I guess. But thanks for the for the question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elvia. Uh, I'm going to move us on uh, to our next resident, um, John Nessie. John is a designer, technologist, and entrepreneur with a broad range of experiences. He's also a, a very good friend of mine. I was very pleased that he could take uh, the time. Since 2006, he has worked across both digital and physical products, and often products that are a combination of the two, including smart home, Internet of Things, or wearable devices. As an early adopter of the Arduino prototyping platform, uh, John Nessie has also taught people of all ages about electronics and programming since 2006, and in 2013 wrote the best-selling technical book, Arduino for Dummies. Uh, but that's uh, not quite where he's going to uh, put it this time around. So yeah. John, over to you. That's great. That's almost like an advert as well. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, 
Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks, Elvia, for that. That was amazing. I'm quite jealous of your of your visual presentation. Mine is substantially less visual, but I'll I'll talk about my experience during the residency. So, uh, as Alex has already alluded to, my my background is design and technology, uh, prototyping, building products for people, uh, and that's um, most of my career has been around building stuff, uh, trying to solve problems. But I've more or less been sort of heads down focused on either my own projects or client projects and not had much time to reflect on what I'm doing, what my practice is um, or how sustainable it is as well. And I think actually on my on my way into the electronics industry, I, some people asked questions about sustainability and it was more or less laughed off as an impossible sort of pipe dream. Um, and yeah, so through this residency, I was hoping to open my mind a little bit to all the possible ways to uh, reduce the uh, carbon footprint of what we're doing, um, not just around electronics and technology, but every possible angle. And I had some crazy notes along the way, such as making a glacier, like if we could make a structure to make a glacier, or even uh, planting underwater seaweed forests. Um, uh, and we had a lot of interesting talks from different angles around finance, um, um, social groups that could uh, build sustainable ecosystems, circular economies locally, that was very interesting as well. But I think like, I don't want to speak for people on the course, but I think like a lot of us, it was quite overwhelming because you get confronted with all these different angles that you can tackle the problem from. Uh, and some seem to need huge governmental shifts, huge amounts of money, huge culture changes. Um, and I went through a, a period of just thinking, how am I ever going to like make it make a difference in this? Um, and some of the points Elvia touched on actually in her presentation is, is to approach it from a personal point of view, like what's your personal experience, what industry are you in, um, and how can you make a small difference? And hopefully all these small differences add up into something greater. So I, I took some time thinking about all these possible things I could make, um, but perhaps the most challenging thing was that often the best thing was to not make anything, not add more to the, the process. Um, a lot of construction or technology building is actually more detrimental than maybe what it offsets. Um, and as a person who loves making things, that was really difficult to, to figure out. Um, so I, I sort of went, went back to my roots a little bit. I, I was an industrial designer by education and got into electronics, meeting, meeting Alex along the way as well. Um, and that was eye-opening and a, a brilliant moment in my life and career, it shaped my entire career beyond that. Um, so I, I took it back to the roots of what, what got me interested in electronics and technology and maybe how you can shape people's attitudes on their way into the industry. Um, we had a really interesting talk by Ross Atkins, who was describing his uh, breakdown of products and their carbon impact, uh, every, everything from public furniture to um, toy robots that you could assemble yourself. And I think the most fascinating thing I took away from that was that in, in Ross's example, he, he tried to minimize the circuit board that the robot was built around. So he made it as small as he possibly could, as few components as possible. But what he found was that the, the fact that he made a circuit board at all was the problem. So the materials in a printed circuit board, a bit like this, uh, this I'll hold it here so you can see, this Arduino board, um, just to give an example, uh, it's uh, glass fiber and resin, which are two horrible materials and almost impossible to break down or reuse in any way. Uh, materials on the board could be dismantled, um, used in other, other boards in the future, and the precious metals could be melted down and reused. So the, the biggest impact I saw was that this board itself is, is the problem. And even as a small studio, um, in our studio, it's just two of us, um, we, we still see quite a lot of waste. So in every project, there'll be circuit boards that are used for uh, a prototype and then left in a cupboard. And I'm pretty sure anyone on this call who's played around with electronics will have a few circuit boards in the back of a drawer somewhere that are gathering dust. Um, so I started thinking about like, what technologies can we use to change the materials that we, we make these boards with? Um, I do have a few initial thoughts about this that came towards the end of the residency, but my main, I, I guess my main challenge that I've, I've sort of been wrestling with a bit is not to try and come up with all the solutions yourself and reinvent things. So my output from the course has actually been a manifesto, which Alex will share 
via the chat if she hasn't already. Um, but it's more a starting point for how we think about the technology we're using and trying to form a bit of a local community, even local in the UK or local in London maybe, but uh, around people who are making technologies that complement each other, that could tackle the problem from different angles. Um, because the, the goal should all be the same thing. It, the difficult thing will be not being competitive within those companies. But I, I think by forming a community around people who are like-minded about sustainability, we stand a better chance of changing habits. Um, and the other, the other angle I, I proposed was that the industry is a, is a huge machine that has been set up a certain way and it will just keep running and running unless it's got a reason to change. Uh, in my experience, I've taught a lot of people about electronics myself, the same way I got into it um, and passed on like this uh, fascination and excitement about it, which I don't want to stop people having. But the, the way I can see to make change that will last beyond me is that if you can replace these boards with something that looks and feels the same, works the same, um, like I, I've written in my manifesto, that's essentially the faken of PCBs. So similar to the vegan food market, if you can make something that looks and tastes as good as the meat alternative, if you can do the same with the materials here, students as they're entering the industry won't, won't expect anything different. And that will eventually lead to demand for those kind of boards in everyday products, things like fridges and irons and uh, microwaves, uh, where the real problem is. But by starting from people entering the electronics industry, you'll have much more impact for future generations. And uh, yeah, that's that's sort of where I got to with the end of the course. It's more about a an understanding of my own feelings about sustainability and how it affects the industry I work in and trying to form more community and a, a common goal uh, to make electronics more sustainable. Um, yeah, and that's a fairly brief presentation, but I'd like to leave it open for any Q&A or um, thoughts that people have as well. Thanks, John. Um, can you um, talk us a little bit through the way in which the manifesto is constructed and the different elements, what you decided to highlight and maybe some of the things you decided not to highlight? Yeah, so, so to start with, I've, I've kept it fairly, fairly broad. Um, uh, more about the some of the approaches I've, I've talked about um, about starting with education. I, I don't wanna see it as a finished, a finished piece yet. Um, it's more like a, a, a rallying point for uh, like-minded people. So um, a lot of it is obvious things like illustrating the impact of these, of these uh, products the start, for a start, like uh, e-waste. So we had some good talks by the Restart Project where, um, where they touched on, on similar topics. And I think that's fairly familiar to people. Uh, but I think going beyond that for people who are in the industry to break down like the core components of your average board, uh, just so you can see where the issues are and where they can be most improved. Um, so I've tried to start from a very a, a broad, like cast a broad net. And I think I'll, I'll try and rather than write everything myself, I'll try and involve other people who are coming up with solutions to contribute to it. And I've already reached out to a few friends in the in the industry. And I can see a few friendly faces on this call as well. So I'm sure I'll be in touch if I haven't already. But um, yeah, yeah, I'd like to treat it more as a first draft and um, yeah, re really get everyone's input to see what the best direction is. Um, can I uh, maybe ask Michael to come in and ask your question? Hey there. Hi there. Um, so I, w one of the things I find challenging with this is just getting the numbers right so in it kind of like at the start of the process yes you, you you want to reflect which parts are good which you know what where the impact is but how how do you know what the impact is mm. when you're starting like I, I, I do little hardware but kind of even just trying to find out the cost of different woods right uh, kind of like what's a good wood what's a bad wood right it's yeah. it, getting getting data is hard so kind of how 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 do you kind of ease that kind of on-ramp? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I think, so one thing we, we touched on during the, um, during the residency and also um, a friend of mine, Gergi is also here, um, informed me of previously, uh, is that sometimes with the data, I think in this case, say um, the example I gave was the, the printed circuit board, which is resin and glass fiber. I think the, the issue is more that it is 
it is not a recyclable material um, rather than how much of it there like how much uh, data there is around that we know we know that the issue is the material itself and at some point I these are my personal feelings that I think you have to stop worrying about the numbers for that and accept that any improvement to that is a good thing um, it may be different when you approach an industry and you're looking at costs for example but I think that's more thinking about the cost equivalent for a, a different solution um because what one frustration i have with data is that it feels like we're gathering lots of data on climate change which is is really just irrelevant because we need to start fixing things rather than worrying about the numbers but even i'm not sure if that answers your question <laughs> but, even with a, a, binary, a binary decision there um i guess then what you want is perhaps just an almanac that you can give people starting out building a product that says good bad good bad you know avoid or something just something yes. to doesn't have to be uh, nuanced, like you say, but mm, yeah, it's yeah. condensed in one place that people can go to. I think that's it. And also, I mean, in this example, because I've, I've worked a lot with Arduino and Raspberry Pi as well, I think if we can get tools like that to take this on board, um, people will accept a change in materials or something. It's more, more because this is the first thing they see and then every circuit board from that is the same. I, th I think there's things like that where um, if we can, get those key players in the education market to change what they're doing first that will have a maybe a slower but a knock-on effect eventually in industry as well that's what i'm hoping i'm gonna uh stop us here because i feel like the deluge of questions uh, could lead to its own conference <laughs> so i'm just gonna ask people please to connect with john please continue having the conversation and yeah. uh, move us over to ruth um, Ruth Shave is a service designer after enc encountering service design while studying for an MA in sustainable development. Ruth joined a tech for good startup and has been designing and delivering digital tools that have social and environmental aims at their heart. Uh, hello, Ruth. Hello, I'm just going to share my screen, if that is possible. Yeah. It definitely should be. It should be. It's telling me to open system preferences. So, yeah. At worst, you might have to come out and get back, come back in again if it does that to you, if you're on a Mac. Yeah, I think it's asking me to do that. Um, we, we will see you in a second then. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Can Wait. everyone see this now? Yes, it's loading and uh, we should be able to see it shortly. Amazing. So, um, yeah, thank you, Alvia and John. It's an honor to be here. Um, my journey um, to the Low Carbon Design Institute um, came because I work in the kind of in glamorous area of procurement and um, asking the question of how do you make that process work for um, communities bringing their needs into the process, especially when it's public money that's being spent. So um, bringing social outcomes into procurement. And I've been part of a team designing and delivering products in this area. Um, sorry, I don't think the sharing is working, is it? Let me just. I think you're going to have to do the coming out and going back here. Oh, no, it's working. Hurrah. Hang on. OK, two seconds. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, we got on to thinking about. Um, so, yeah, we've created a couple of products in around bringing community needs into procurement and we got around thinking in um, around net zero so how do you influence supply chains is it possible to use um, procurement processes to help move suppliers along the journey to net zero so um, I started researching with a few organizations an energy company transport company council and housing association at the end of last year um, and the start of this year to find out where they were at in engaging with their supply chains. And that research was formalized into a report, um, which if you'd like a copy, then contact me and I'd be happy to share it with you um, with potential areas to explore and further research questions. So then, um, yeah, enter the Low Carbon Design Institute, where, which I took as a chance to reflect on the project going forward and use what I learned to create a set of principles, which I could use. So why create principles? Well, it felt too early to build a prototype and I'll explain um, more about that later. Um, 
They help root the work, especially when you're working in complex processes. They're working principles, so they're meant to be developed, added to, edited, a bit like um, John's response. Um, it's kind of a, a prototype of response in a way. Um, and they're also like a direct artifact from the residency. So um, fellow residents might be able to, to recognize a mixture of the conversations and ideas that we've encountered kind of blended into some takeaways for my work. So now I'll take you through the principles and explain how they relate to helping supply chains get to net zero. The first principle is understand values and challenges. So this is what I want the starting point to be for the next stage of my project. Um, in our research, we found there's a lot of opportunity to on one hand educate suppliers in the supply chain and on the other hand, combine that education with kind of targeted initi initiatives to help them drive them forward towards taking action. And while I thought about prototyping something during the residency, I felt like a, instead a good next step would be to um, talk to suppliers, understand their day-to-day -day challenges and barriers so that we can actually make something that's going to work for them, not just a top-down educational tool um, or carbon measurement tool. Because if we can solve, if we can problem solve alongside them um, and add their perspective to the mix from the start, the end result is going to be so much better. Help create ownership. So one of the questions asked by um, Dr. Pierce OG in one of, one of the speakers in, in his talk was how and who benefits. Um, so lots of organizations in the supply chains are coming at net zero from a compliance perspective, um, looking to meet UK government legislation rather than be leaders necessarily. Um, for some, that doesn't mean that they don't want to change they just don't always have capacity and the point about ownership is about being as uh, organizations that have expertise or um, people trying to help influence in the space how are we good stewards of knowledge and how can we share it and help others to use it and shape it going forward um, so seeing organizations in the supply chain as potential partners on the path to net zero rather than like dragging down the effort on behalf of the bigger organizations that maybe are further along in man managing their own scope one and two emissions. Um, and like going further with the question, um, asking what they need to be able to take ownership of the net zero challenge themselves and help to drive that change. Um, and also help create an environment so that those who show leadership or move forward profit from um, the solutions or ideas that they come up with in their area of expertise. Um, principle number three is question the degree of problem solving. So this principle is about asking whether the solutions that um, we're helping to create go far enough. Is it incremental change? Uh, on the flip side of that, where, where am I helping to uphold um, like damaging or oppressive systems? Um, especially in supply chains built on efficiency and procurement built on maximizing value for money. Um, so, and a lot, like along with that, if I'm creating a solution or um, helping create a solution that taps into the procurement process, am I allowing organizations to engage with communities and the environment in a tokenistic way or actually help move them forward and, and these organizations change for the long term? The next principle is see things relationally. So um, I think Elvia touched on this and, and John as well, um, that like, yes, data and measurement around energy use and carbon reduction are well and good. And in some ways they're essential for creating accountability as organizations make their progress in reducing their emissions. Um, and we'd actually thought that that would be a starting point for our work, um, but instead of focusing on those things as like a golden bullet or the key, what if we reframe the problem relationally, um, just as like the carbon cycle is a set of interdependent relationships in supply chains, where uh, are the exchanges not mutually beneficial? Where are they exploitative? Who is not being listened to? Whose perspectives are being undervalued? And um, where are we in danger of supporting like an unjust transition how can we help create a just transition to net zero? 
subtract where possible. Um, this is probably the most feels to me like the most abstract of the principles. Um, and it's something that like John has spoken about, um, the idea of do we actually need to create something? And I think, yeah, in, in terms of processes like procurement or um, yeah, can we uh, can we create a new process that's less complicated than an old process? Maybe, I mean, that's probably uh, talking a bit kind of beyond what we're trying to do, but I don't know. Um, the principle is inspired by landscape architect Jeremy Rice's talk on rewilding, where he spoke about removing an overgrown invasive species to allow the ecosystem diversity to flourish. Um, so, yeah, that's more of kind of just a an idea to think about in terms of um, supply chains for me. The tools are not the goal. Um, we've talked about this in terms of uh, like data and measurement um, being kind of tools towards a bigger goal. Um, and I was thinking about what that goal actually is. And I came up with another kind of working definition. Um, like it's, uh, it's probably going to sound really cheesy, but it's actually about the flourishing of humanity, um, individuals, as well as, the, as well as like the whole um, in partnership with the ecosphere and communities of animal and plant life referred to in that word. And from a supply chain perspective, um, that means people being supported in livelihoods that enable them to live financially sustainable lives, bring them fulfillment and make a net positive contribution to society. Um, so keeping that goal in mind with further work um, that I'm part of and my organisation is part of. Um, so that's the end of the principles. Thanks all for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, over to you, Alex. Thank you, Ruth. That's fantastic. Um, can I get you to reflect uh, for a minute or so on, um, on uh, the applicability of these principles, do you think, in the format that you anticipate they might take uh, through your work and through uh, the partner conversations that you have and just the ways in which people tend to speak to each other, which is not usually through principles, but through either actions or spreadsheets or presentations? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's about like using them um, with my team and I work very closely with one of the team members. So I think they're going, they'll be used to shape our work. Um, and then the ideas that we bring as an organization, kind of pitching ideas um, to work alongside contracting authorities um, to use and pilot within their organizations. But I think, yeah, I think um, there's, I mean, you could have picked, I could have picked one of these principles and, and dug in deeper to it so there's there's opportunity for me to do that um as well and yeah and and dig, dig deeper and, and maybe create some more outputs based on each one or create more writing um, yeah it sounds awesome thank you so much for um presenting your work to us and again uh, for everyone on the uh, chat i'm always uh, just pushing people and please do have a look at uh, ruth's article uh, on the website um, Next up, we've got Carl. Uh, Carl is a diverse background uh, covering areas from social entrepreneurship to business development to event design. Uh, he's now bringing his focus to the intersection of design uh, and climate slash sustainability. Having just completed a, a diploma in design thinking for sustainability, he's taking his passion for UX and storytelling into this new realm. Uh, Carl, thank you so much and over to you. Okay, cool. So that intro does me fine. And if I'll just go straight into it. So I think I probably explored maybe five or six different things for this residency in terms of responses. Two or three of them didn't fully materialize. So I'm just not even going to bother mentioning them. So I'm just going to look at three, three things in particular. So first one is a hackathon. Then we're going to look at some guilt. And then we're going to go into language. And Ruth has kindly offered to do the, the guilt aspect of this. Um, so just a little background, I found out about a hackathon, it was a space data hackathon that was going to be, it just happened last weekend, um, and I knew it was coinciding with the deadline for the low carbon design, and I thought, is it worth being part of this, but it was something I really wanted to, and I thought, look, I'll, I'll only take part if 
I can bring something or bring an idea or create something that's going to be relevant to the low carbon thing. So I'm really passionate about sea swimming and water quality. So I brought that idea and um, formed a team around that using space data and observational data and um, brought that to the weekend. As part of it, then created this, I'll just show this little geo app on ArcGIS. So this allows you as a swimmer or a beach goer, you can locate your area and um, you can input the time and date. And then you can input anything that's kind of potentially hazardous or um, dangerous to other swimmers. So jellyfish or um, water pollution or anything like that. You can add details and comments and a few little more details. And then the idea being that that gets transferred into a dashboard. So let's say, for example, I see a, the lion's mane jellyfish. I input it onto the little app and then someone going to that beach can then see that and then take precautions against, against swimming or not. So really intense few days. There was a build up for it as well. Um, and yeah, but we won. So my team won. So it, was, it, it, it worked out. It worked out well in the end. So that's stage one of my response. That's kind of ancillary supplementary to um to the residency um the next one's looking at guilt so guilt came up a lot for for folks during the residency obviously with their carbon footprints and yeah how carbon intensive our lives are compared to other parts of the world and i i, I felt guilt big time one night more and it, i think it was more personal stuff but instead of trying to deny it or or push it away i just embraced it dove into it um this is the clean version of what i was left with i edited out an awful lot of stuff but this bit, if Ruth is happy to jump in and 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 read this out, and um, we'll move on from there. The poem called Guilt Edged. Guilt just tears through me, making its presence felt. Why should I be having a good time if others aren't? Why don't they have this? They need they need it more than I do. Why can't they have it too? I'm already defending myself in my head, already making a case. I don't want to hurt your feelings, don't want to cause any hurt. I'm hurt. Explaining, rationalising, framing. Why is there always blame? I'm not blaming. Why is this always the same? I'm not gaining. Moving on can be a mother, binding myself with these invisible lines, tying myself to expectations that I don't even know exist. Why am I putting myself in a default defensive position? This ain't healthy. When do you know what you're doing is crossing the line? Where is the line? What is the line? I'm already starting to worry, overthink and complicate things. It's already becoming a heated discussion, yet we haven't even spoken. That's why it can be safer in the box. I'm not joking. I'm setting up these expectations and then have to break them down. I'm setting the conditions and then railing against them, against their unfairness. I set them up knowing I'm not being fair to myself. So then when they come to pass, I have to argue my case. I have to make them see the thing I set up, knowing that it was wrong to begin with. It haunts. I know it so well, I can feel it coming. It doesn't let me away with much. Guilt for having more, guilt for having fun, guilt feeling responsible for someone. What even is guilt? Not all equal, not worthy, having more than others, Deserving, empathy for others. Same, same, I know your shame. I want others to have a better life than me. And then when they do, I want mine to be better than theirs. First thing in the morning, I'm not even awake and I can feel it creeping. Descending, I'm powerless. It's gonna wrap me up there. <clears throat> Make sure I know it's there. Gonna wrap me up until I blank stare. Gonna wrap me up, this shit ain't fair. You're going to listen to what it has to say. No tapping out of this until you hit your guilt quota, until it seeps through you, until it's etched in bone. Racked, it's going to fuck you up when you're alone. Oh, it's going to fuck you up when you're alone. Do you think you got away with it? You thought you could feel good and enjoy yourself without any strings, to be carefree, even for a couple of hours. Bitch, please, you know the good is guilt edged. You know me, you know how I operate. You know how this thing works, bro. I'm gonna keep making you feel bad until their lives improve. I'll be right here waiting, waiting for you to momentarily forget about them just so I can remind you painfully. So you feel it, so you don't get used to it. 
so you don't forget it. I'll be seeing you again soon. Thanks, Ruth. I hadn't actually timed that. I didn't realize it was quite a long one. So I'll run on to the, I'll run on to the last piece. So the last piece really around language and perception and going through kind of all the speakers again and looking at kind of find, trying to find this golden thread. And this was the one that kind of came through and I haven't, it's not an exhaustive list, but just some of the reference that from some of the speakers like Adam spoke about, two people might be using the same words. Um, Jeremy said about the question about people's perception. I'll just pick out some of the, the main ones here. Fraser talked about um, the precedent in the language and Dr. Pierce talked about um, the idea of language. So that was a kind of common thread I identified. And as I was looking back over the talk, talks, I started to kind of assemble a, a kind of compendium of terminology of concepts, some that I didn't fully understand, some that I knew quite well, some that we made up as we went along. So that kind of became this top 100 terms. Um, and then the idea was that, that I'd kind of document my understanding of them in this moment in time without kind of referencing or looking them up and then I could use it as a as a marker for the future. So there's still an awful lot to do there. And then the last thing I'll show you, I'll end on a kind of fun thing. So my idea was then to kind of translate these concepts, something quite nebulous into something a bit more concrete. So I was thinking the idea of turning them into brands. Um, so the, I'll just show you a few of these that I put together. So the first one, Fragile Rock, that was a typo, I think, for Fraggle Rock, but then it be, kind of became a thing and it's a perfect metaphor for Earth. So I like that one and, and, and use that one there. Then we talked about this. This is slough. This is the Irish word for, for nari seaweed or lava seaweed. That might be familiar. So I took the slack thing. It's kind of sounded similar and we worked it. Um, and I like the community aspect of, of what, you, what once would have been a community endeavor of seaweed harvesting and then obviously the community of slack. Um, the next one then, Michelle talked about this song Despacito that because of its billions of views, its internet carbon footprint is like 850,000 barrels of oil. So that just blew my mind. And I took the, if anyone remembers Spaced, the TV show, I took that theme because I just thought it was such an out there vast number. Um, Priya talked about Buckminster Fullerene. So I took the book fast um, tonic wine and made it Buckminster Fullerene with the, with the icon here and that idea of energy. And I think that's a drink that is meant to renown to give you a lot of energy. Um, Emma's not here, but she talked a lot about universal basic income. So I guess that one's for Emma. And then finally, we have Fraser Stewart talked about being a class trader. So I just took Reebok's classics and I said, it's OK to be a class trader. Um, and so that's all of those together. And that is me. I'm probably over time. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That was fantastic. A fantastic array of responses. Um, I just want to get your thought on, um, uh, you know, just to, I guess you've responded in lots of different ways with lots of different um, out types of outputs. And is this something that you're thinking of returning to these responses? Are you thinking um, of selecting one or two in order to kind of move forward with them? You know, where does your, where does your heart take you right now after four weeks? <laughs> yeah, like... I came in thinking I was going to rework something that I'd done before that was around a kind of a story narrative of a quiz. Um, so I, and I have been working on it through the residency, but there was just too much left in it for me to complete. So I probably will go back to that. I do love the idea as well of turning just concepts into like that, something more of a tangible brand, um, especially if it's a nebulous concept or something you're not familiar with, maybe it's to do with the design or climate and try and anchor that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely be exploring more around concepts and terminology and visualizing concepts. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the, the narrative quiz and, and, and finish that off as well. Fantastic, thank you so much, Carl. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, us to move on to Lucy. Uh, Lucy has a background that spans bioscience, technology and community activism. Um, her work as a design researcher aims to deliver services and systems that work for people and for the needs of the planet. Lucy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Um, and so nice to see so many of my colleagues here um, and some friends as well. Um, I don't have a fancy background or um, a presentation. Um, I'm just going to reflect on 
my piece of writing um, and my thoughts around that really, and I will bring up um, what I have produced at the end. Um, but yeah, I think for me, this has just been such a wonderful experience as somebody who's never really participated in something like this before. Um, and it's been, uh, I've used it as a way to get away from my practice as a service designer at Snook. Um, and I've just found it so particularly inspiring to be around um, so many artists um, and learn more about everyone's practice um, and just like, yeah, loads of admiration for this group. Um, I guess, you know, reflecting on the talks that um, particularly inspired me, um, the ones that stood out were uh, delivered by Anna from Sentient Media about, um, I just, I guess, just the barbaric nature of the way that we treat animals. Um, and then I was also uh, really inspired by Jeremy Rye, um, a, 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 a landscape architect who thinks a lot about wilding. Um, and through all of that, and it being, I guess, early summer, I've also been very inspired by my garden. And I started looking at things from both a climate as well as a biodiversity perspective, which I think often gets, um, I guess, relegated behind um, dropping carbon, but it's something I think about quite a lot as well. Um, and therefore, maybe I missed the brief, um, but I do think they're, they're very related, um, especially for those of us as prolific uh, uh, emitters of carbon in the West, um, who I believe really need to just reimagine our relationships to um, our surroundings. So I think for me, this residency just turns into a bit of personal exploration um, on my reflections on the planet, which sounds super indulgent, um, but I do believe, uh, like I said, that we all need to get a little bit closer to it. Um, and we really need to make um, that accessible, that kind of access to nature accessible for everyone. And I'm particularly curious about this, what, what this means in an urban environment and have been thinking a lot about um, wild in the context of my home here in London um, and what, that all, what all that means. So um, I think Alex has probably shared um, what's in the uh my submission kind of in the in the chat and i'll just bring it up um as well um but basically oh i'm actually not going to bring it up because <laughs> then i can't see my notes um but basically grow me well um is a response to all of these musings um i've had a lot of fun just being a little bit more observational in my day to day i do hope um it will turn into a series of writings which i think will help me keep um thoughts about climate my 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 work um, in the everyday for me. So I've kind of set myself a bit of that accountability challenge as a result of this residency. Um, and Ross um, Atkin reminded me that designers make a lot of assumptions and I feel quite guilty of that in my job. Um, and I wanted my imagining um, about soil and growing for health um, to be somewhat grounded in evidence. So I spent quite a bit of my time um, reaching out to some soil scientists just to get a little bit of social proof, I suppose, that the idea that I was dreaming up in my head wasn't completely uh, separate from the science. Um, and it actually kind of excited people, which was kind of cool. But it also taught me that there's um, a lot of research on nutrition and the human microbiome and, and soil um, and contributions of soil, obviously, to um, carbon uh, carbon capture. Um, but I turned my attention more to a curiosity about flowers, front gardens, um, and hung a lot of my thinking around one bacteria that can trigger a really positive neurobiological response. So really, I just kind of wondered out loud, and this was my submission about um, if it would be possible to identify what the right kind of bacterial and fungal mixes for a person's individual health and suggest plants for growing that are sustained well in that mix. So delivering gardens that are planted based on those interactions and not just aesthetics. Um, it turns out this isn't a totally outlandish idea based on the conversations that I've had um, out of the research aims of most soil scientists. And I think um, really relevantly, like we just don't really have the tools to measure the complexity um, of, of the microbiome of so soils and, and how that interacts with, with our neurobiology, um, which kind of floored me and humbled me at the same time. Um, and I guess uh, the other little fun thing that I had um, which I will bring up on the screen um, is what I guess while I spent a lot of time thinking um, about um, can you I hope you can all see that um, thinking about um, these types of things I actually um, saw a bee that I thought was dead in a flower and I brought it home and it ended up getting nestled in a larger flower that I kind of cut out <laughs> and the bee wasn't dead it sleeps 
uh, it was asleep in this flower and I I don't know why I found this so inspiring, but I think it's a bit of a criticism of our kind of consumer culture um, and as a bit of a laugh, because I think we do need to find lightness <laughs> in and around um, climate. Uh, I made this luxury bee bed ad um, as an endorsement for um, my new series of writings um, on provocations on the planet. So um, I hope that keeps things a little bit light um, and fun. Um, and I hope this will be the first of what I intend to make a couple musings on the things that I'm thinking about as a result of this residency. So I'm just gonna leave it there and then open it up to any questions. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Lucy, that was fantastic. Uh, Mariana, did you want to um, reformulate or formulate a question for Lucy? Uh, Lucy, yeah, you, you talk about your personal life and your personal interaction. Um, I'm very, I'm very um, aware of the fact that everything that we do is basically, or everything that we interact with, basically we do and interact to build the life that we want to live. And even companies that are profit driven, they are profit driven based on the lifestyle that we want. And then, and then we pay them to deliver whatever products or services can help us live our lives. So my question is really in terms of uh, the, the foundation to make something a sustained change for, low, for a low carbon future, have you reflected at all on the personal changes of choice, of personal choice, as well as changes in lifestyle for a personal low carbon footprint life um, in, in, as the driver for building a sustained future? Because everything around us that we pay money for, we pay to be able to live the life that we want to live. So if we demand a, a low carbon lifestyle, everything even people that don't even think about low carbon will start to invest money in producing that yeah uh, i didn't think it's about a, it's a question for reflection it's yeah. not it's not a, it's not a, yeah mm. yeah yeah no and i i guess i kind of thought about it more in the sense of um that but relate to like bees not not humans uh -huh. um uh -huh. and i had a little bit of fun <laughs> thinking about that just in terms of um yeah, I guess uh, just silly musings about what it means for, but what if we flip the narrative and thought about it um, with 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 more than humans, which is why I played with this idea of that, that be ad. But um, I think that's what a lot of us have been thinking about that as a result of this residency. And I think we'll be sitting on that for quite a while. Thank you. I'm going to have to move us on. So thank you so much, Lucy, for presenting your work. Please connect with Lucy um, and uh, the rest of her work as well. Uh, I'm going to move us on to Joe. Um, Joe, and this is, I feel like a kind of uh, somehow a flight operator. Uh, Joe is a designer and furniture maker. He studied fine art, cabinet making, and product design, and his interests are a mix of all three. He runs his business from his workshop in East London and likes to explore outcomes through an examination of materials, processes, and provenance. Uh, so I think there'll be some links to some of the questions we've had earlier. Welcome, Joe. Hi. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Oh. Um, can everyone see that? I can. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, okay, so I wanted to just kind of start by saying that, um, uh, like the outcome of the work that I did was, you know, when I came on the residency, I assumed I'd be working on um, a project that I was doing just before, which was to do with um, carbon in wood and have a, you know, develop that idea. Um, but after the presentations and the discussions with the other residents and you know I, I felt like um, inspired more towards sort of a local community sort of orientated um, project and something you know in my in my locality in in the city which is is sort of where I've always lived 
was was more personal and more relevant. And uh, there was a project that I had sort of started thinking about with with a friend of mine, uh, Lara Kinnear, and I thought there would be a good opportunity to prototype that um, as an outcome. And so that's what I did. Um, this uh, this is a this is a photo I took yesterday morning uh, after I installed these bollard seats um, on my local high street. Um, the uh, so it's a project that um, aims to put additional seating in the public realm, repurposing existing street furniture to divert functionality towards more socially focused uses. Um, I want to mention Simone Ferrancina's presentation because at this moment, because he had uh, a brilliant presentation all about um, executive design and uh, reusing materials. And he, he kind of, he had language for things and descriptions around this, this kind of way of working that, that, that really helped me to kind of understand how to kind of work in this field with more sort of authority, I guess, or understand it a bit more than I had in the past, even though i would always been interested in reclaim materials and, um, and, uh, and reuse of, 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 and, and, and ad hocism and, and, and these books that he referred to. So it was a brilliant talk. Um, and everything about the, the, the residency actually, Alex has been fantastic. So thank you very much. Um, so the, the, these, these, uh, I'm going to do is present like a, my design methodology really. Um, but I, I just going to read this other bit out. Uh, it's intended as a point of departure for discussion about the role of the high streets and the local communities in working towards net zero emissions. Um, the new so social dynamics of the pandemic, which was like a key aspect of the project uh, from Lara's point of view it was like, how do we, how do we get people socializing again? You know, this idea of um, uh, spatial distance rather than social distance. That's one of the things that she came to me with as this, as this sort of focus, which I really liked. Um, and then as well as just child safety, space for play in the city. You know, these are things that I've, I've you know, I really relate to. Um, and and I, I kind of, I think Emma, who's not on the talk, but she, throughout the residency, she's she's kind of had this kind of urban child kind of um, point of view that's, that I've really, um, I've really found helpful to sort of frame the way that I'm thinking. Um, so thanks to Emma as well for all her sort of inputs on the, on the discussions. Um, but it's just a seat as well. I, I like to say that because, you know, ultimately it's just a seat, right? Um, Um, so here, here is the road that I that I chose to to uh, to make some street furniture for. It is Chatsworth Road. It's in in my local area. It's a road that is um, really quite well designed and sort of developed for for pedestrians and 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 the, the high street generally. It's had you know pavements widened at the corners and the crossroads. It has existing street furniture. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's new trees being planted. Um, so once I had kind of thought of this idea of like a bollard seat, then I really had to kind of like understand exactly what I was doing and, and got a bit nervous about like making something that's going to be dangerous for people when they're crossing the roads or, you know, is this a good idea after all? Um, and then there's a sort of area in the bottom right hand, uh, slide, there's a kind of a part of the, the road that they don't want you to kind of cross here, but they have bollards. Um, there's a, there's a un, unseen in the shot is like a zebra crossing. So, and then there's, there's planters either side of the road that kind of stop you crossing at that point. Um, and there's enough pavement space for hanging out. So when I saw this little area, I thought, yeah, okay, th this would be work. This would work for seating um, attached to the bollards. And I noticed this nice behavior of some of the shopkeepers in the bottom left-hand slide um, uh, picture rather, which uh, shopkeepers sitting with their backs to the road, kind of in the manner that I was 
probably going to make the seat. So there was there was sort of some encouragement for me there. Um, so then I got about kind of understanding the bollard a bit more deeply, and uh, you know, so, so I had to had to kind of fairly accurately kind of survey them with drawing and measurements, and then sort of quite inaccurately do these kind of rubbings, which I, I quite like to do at the moment. And uh, um, I'm not sure how useful they are, but they I quite like them. It refers to my other project that I thought I was going to do, so maybe that's why I did that. Um, and then this is the state of like play in my workshop most of the time. You know, when when you've done a, a cutting list from a load of plywood or whatever you're using, you kind of have all these bits and um, that, that are kind of going to end up in the bin. And in terms of like the material story of this object and mindful of of um, the resource that, that 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 this is, you know, these are these are perfectly you know lovely pieces of birch plywood that. Are just a bit too small to do anything with normally and they just will go in the bin and um i tried you know i, I can't pretend that this is like a a, a a a product that is um that is made out of waste but i did try to uh use more little bits than i would normally on a, on a project like this and and i think there is um it's small enough to kind of to, to piece to make things aspects of it piecemeal which i think um makes sense um when it comes to scaling this kind of idea and that those sorts of um um sort of approaches are harder to um to square off um but there was one one presentation uh, well uh, rebecca's presentation which was focused on community economies and and the way that we can kind of use um we can get people to invest in 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 their own you know this project basically needs 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 to be invested in by the local community to use it and to um and potentially to make it you know there is there's ways that it, you could scale this or and even the production of it to include maybe local workshops who have piles of stuff like this like mine, you know, spare product and maybe the time and and the inclination to to work um, towards sort of rolling these sorts of furniture objects out into the world with uh, with a community production model, I guess. What else was it? So then, this is the kind of nature of my my last week or or so is is, is kind of visiting these this bollard um, with bits of wood and uh sort of like measuring it taking what i thought was going to work and um seeing if it kind of did or not um the idea was that the the, the plywood was gonna was gonna attach itself sort of into the the ribs of the bollard and and sort of like stickle bricks sort of like hold itself against the bollard um so i had to kind of suss that out and see if that did work in the way that i thought it would um and uh so there was going back and forth last weekend i i i had uh two of my children to look after and um i convinced them to come down and and, and test the first prototype um iteration and that's kind of it's quite good um you get good insights when you go there with the kids i mean firstly they weren't as self-conscious as i was to be messing about around the bollard and so they they kind of their behavior and their insights are a bit more natural and quite useful to to kind of to 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 hear and to to experience so um they were kind of positive about it all as well so that that was a good that was a good a good uh good bit of feedback and um then then we then we went roller skating and skateboarding um and i wanted to to say to Emma actually that I'd bought the book that she recommended and referred to in 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 her work um, about urban playgrounds, and I immediately said, you know, let's get the skates on, let's go out. And and up the road from us, I, there was there was this kind of thing going on. And these guys um, had a key to the manhole cover of the of the of the street, and just used it to make a ramp. And uh, I, I I mean I'm not a skateboarder, but 
um, I really like skateboarding, the skateboarding community and the way that they just, at, you know, repurpose the, the built environment for their, for their fun. And I, I was kind of emboldened by their approach and their kind of like attitude towards um, the city uh, with what I was doing. Um, and that, and then just, I guess that, that was just a nice reminder, a little shot in the arm of like, yeah, you can do this sort of stuff. It's, it's good fun. And uh, that's, that's important. Um, so then uh, yesterday, this, this is now at, I, I knew that, that I wanted to color these things black to kind of um, blend in a bit more with the bollard and uh, be kind of like, owned a bit more by the street rather than stand out too much you know and uh, i think that um that works quite well you know you kind of they they look like they might have gone in with the bollard almost you know they're, they're sort of they look mean you know purposeful um and uh that helps with them being accepted um i found like when i was when i was installing um you know, I feel like I didn't, I don't want to be like putting something like the, 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 the free bikes onto the street, which no one really wants to be kicking around in the, in the landscape. And, you know, I want, and so I feel a little bit um, self-conscious about presuming that this is a good idea on everyone else. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, so I had my high vis on and I was trying to look like I, I was kind of supposed to be there. And immediately, like, you know, the guys just started talking to me. It's like, are you, are you making a seat out of that bollard? And, and, and I'm, and I'm sort of pretending that he didn't talk to me or I'm just don't know what, how to respond. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, I, I am. So, <laughs> and he's like, great, you know, that's a great idea, you know? And then that was him. He, 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 other people engaged me asked me if I worked for the council, which I just didn't feel I could, you know, lie about and, uh, you know, no, I'm not. And, you know, and then they're there when you, when you move that on to, he's like, someone else said, was this just like a gorilla? Is this a gorilla? You know, this is like gorilla gardening. And I was like, well, kind of, yeah. And, and they're happy about it. You know, but everyone was positive. So gradually I relaxed a little bit more. Um, but, um, yeah, um, what am I gonna, let me read some of this ad hoc net. Yeah, so you can- No, I'm giving you one more minute. Okay, okay, uh, I'm gonna move on then. That was it. Um, this is just some some final pictures. Um, I wanted to talk about the way that the street has like a lot of cafe seating, um, which you can see in the top picture here, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's commodified, you know, it's, it's for, um, it's, you, you know, you have to buy 10 pound noodles to go sit there and it's different to, to a bench or, um, you know, to, to, to just a, to just a public seat. So I, uh, I, wa I wanted it to, 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 to form part of that, um, to part of the, part of the, the urban landscape that is not commodified basically. Um, and I feel like now is a good time to, to be making these kinds of plays in the public realm because, you know, it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's up for grabs. There's, there's lots of changes to the way that we're interacting, um, you know, because of the pandemic. And I think that, you know, making city spaces, public spaces more enjoyable and more fun um, is, 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 is healthy for everyone. Um, Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks, Joe. Um, can I just, um, uh, call uh, Lara up uh, just to get uh, your your take on this? Because obviously this is something that uh, you've contributed to and worked with Joe on. And I just thought I'd give you the opportunity to just uh, give us uh, the town planning side of the story in terms of how feasible these kinds of experiments are. Um, hi there, I'm, I'm on the school run at the minute, so sorry for the background noise. Um, and I, I missed a little bit of your question, but I, I think it was around how we can make more of this happen and make the street a good place to be, is that right? Yeah, let's go with yes, yes. 
Um, do you want to repeat your question quickly? Is that no? That that would be great. It would just be great to to get the other side of this, which is uh, obviously this was an experiment done uh, in in this context. But how do you imagine uh, working in as an architect? Uh, how do you imagine this being taken up more in our city? Uh, I think it depends on who's doing it, and I think that in itself is a is a big question. Um, I think collaborating with Joe on this has been fantastic because we took an idea and a belief that our streets need to be ready for us coming back together again post-COVID, whenever post-COVID or variations of it might be. And they aren't ready at the minute. And what we've seen over the last year is the streets being taken up by highway furniture, which isn't very friendly and certainly not to kids. So we need our public open spaces to be a bit more encouraging of us building up trust again to, to come back together. Um, and I think it's gonna be really hard for councils to work on that, certainly to do it quickly um, and in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I think this sort of collaboration and direct action could maybe spur on some things happening at different speeds. Um, and I, Joe and I have talked about how we could approach some um, other landowners um, that might start piloting it and trialing uh, seats and perhaps other furniture um, because we know there's so many good ideas out there but it really is about trying to make it happen um, as swiftly as possible otherwise we'll miss a golden opportunity to reclaim the streets in ways that really allow us to come together. That's fantastic, Laura. Thank you so much for um, just uh, contributing. I'm sorry I put you on the spot in the middle of this. Um, <laughs> no worries. We're at extremely late, so I'm going to move us on, but please do reach out to Joe, commission him to do more interesting work, and also look at his um, uh, latest piece of work also that is in the building center, I think for the next little while, even perhaps for the rest of the summer. Uh, and it's a wonderful piece about uh, carbon emissions and wood and the origins of wood. So to answer some of Michael's questions earlier, I think you'll get a kick out of seeing that project. So thank you, Joe. Um, I'm going to move us on to Donna. Donna is a uh, socially engaged artist working at the intersection of performance, installation, and social design with a focus on challenging minority exclusion and environmental injustice. Through participatory methods that democratize access to art and knowledge, she aims to give agency to underserved migrant groups so they become active co-producers of culture. Hello, Donna, and thank you. Hello, and thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, so I'm just, let me know if you can see this full screen. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, brilliant. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, so my name is Dana, as Alex said, I moved to the UK 12 years ago and I left my home country as an artist and landed here as an immigrant. Um, so I was told I was part of a, um, of a country called Eastern Europe, which I'm sure much to no one's surprise um, is a country that doesn't exist. Um, I was demonized for stealing jobs, for indulging in health tourism and for scrounging on benefits and possibly doing all of those things at the same time. So predictably, all of my work is informed by immigration and displacement. However, I am also a white woman with a lot of privilege and access to education, skills, and knowledge. So I have used all possible arts mediums to tell the government, uh, tabloid media, and Priti Patel with her catastrophic new plan for immigration to get knotted. But more recently, I started working with a group of young asylum seekers and refugees who do not have the same privilege. What they do have instead is first-hand experience of the repercussions of environmental injustice. So I joined this residency to become more carbon literate and to hear from people I wouldn't normally have the opportunity to engage with and to challenge my own biased assumptions. And during the residency, I questioned my privilege of having the opportunity to reflect on the climate crisis from the comfort of my living room, while simultaneously dealing with immigration lawyers, the home office and solicitors who were chasing some of these young people. But in turn, the young people did not have the opportunity to think about the climate crisis, and that's because they are constantly living through it. Um, after being displaced from their countries due to violence, which is exacerbated by droughts and harvest failures, they arrive here and they too are blamed for stealing jobs, for indulging in health tourism, and for scrounging on benefits. 
Seeing how underprepared the British immigration system is for the arrival of these young people who do have legal status, I wondered what will happen when climate refugees arrive in other countries. And at the moment, the, the number is estimated to rise to 1 billion by 2050. On the first day of the residency, Alex asked us why we joined. And I replied that I'm interested in democratizing this complex knowledge to people who don't have access to it. But as the lectures and the conversations we had within the group developed, I realized that maybe the democratization of knowledge is biased on my side, and that perhaps I should also focus on learning from those who don't necessarily get these platforms. So my response to the residency was a think piece advocating for this. We focus a lot on solutions for the climate crisis, but these are almost exclusively developed by the people at the top. And just like nature needs biodiversity to thrive, our, our societies need diversity. The more perspectives we can involve, especially for, for those for whom the climate crisis meant leaving their homelands, the more resilience we can build. I've had the privilege to learn from young asylum seekers and refugees how to forage, how to create makeshift tools, and most, perhaps more importantly, how to build and preserve community. When I recently reminded a young person about a visit to a cultural, cultural institution in central London, which I presumed he would enjoy, he responded by saying that he'll only attend if I also come to his neighborhood so he can teach me how the bad boys live. So I'm interested in how we shift our mindsets from power over to power with. Instead of creating new designs, perhaps we can truly question if privilege can be designed out, if racism can be designed out, if patriarchy can be designed out, and if colonialism can be designed out. So based on the idea that we can learn so much from them, I imagined the ultimate low carbon experience to take place in the global north. This would take shape as a workshop or as a multitude of workshops delivered by the young asylum seekers and refugees on becoming more resilient, on gaining survival strategies and learning the importance of communities. And these workshops are based on four principles. On trust, that the responsible adult will allow themselves to spend the day with a stranger who will teach them how to see places and people through a completely different lens. And in return, they will trust that the young person will keep them safe, well-fed and curious. The workshops are also based on fairness. So the young people will be treated as consultants or experts and paid accordingly. The workshops are also based on empowerment and reciprocity. So not only the young people's resilience and power will be acknowledged so they can gain confidence in their skills, they will also take ownership of the insights they've gained. And obviously last but not least, this, um, this workshop is also based on joy. The doom, and gloom of, uh, the doom and gloom of the climate crisis is completely real, but if we act with pleasure and we place value on joy, then we can motivate others to join and to grow the movement. So when leaving behind the tokenism of being a good ally, we can reflect on the knowledge that we gain from people that we presume to help. And we can use our agency and privilege to amplify this. This way we become stronger in our demands, we fight from the same angle, and we hold governments and corporations to account. This work is necessary and not charitable. Mutual aid is a voluntary reciprocal exchange of resources and services for mutual benefit. Spending time with people such as young asylum seekers and refugees will allow us to truly understand the benefit. Non-dominating power will teach us how to share it more gracefully, will lead us to meaningful collective action, and repel our paralyzing cl climate panic. So I'm really grateful that by joining the Low Carbon Design Institute, I could verbalize, I could think up and materialize a concrete proposal that connects the people I work with, art, the city I live in, and new people interested in joining. So will you sign up? Thank you, Donna, that was fantastic. Um, I am uh, going to ask Mariana to come in again with her question. Or maybe not. Um, can I get you to reflect a little bit on, um, obviously this is uh, one step of multiple steps and I know that you've been, um, you're a now currently artist in residence in another program entirely. Um, can you talk a little bit about the usefulness to you as an artist of these residencies and, um, you know, as ways to engage, but also ways to build tools, which I think is partly what you've done here. 
Absolutely, yes. And I think I think every opportunity that we have to engage in as many platforms as possible. I think at the beginning when I when I questioned whether I should join the Low Carbon Design Institute, obviously my hat if I am not a designer kicked in. Um, and I was really wondering what I could actually, you know, contribute with. But I think it's so, so, so important to understand that obviously we are dealing with a climate crisis. It is a crisis and a crisis doesn't only need scientists or designers or artists, it needs everyone. So I think as far as I'm concerned, being part of as many initiatives as possible and having access to as many communities as possible will only strengthen um, the tools. I think communities are a tool, a really important one. Wonderful. I want to thank you so much for sharing your work with us today and ask uh, us to uh, move on to Michelle, if we can. Um, Michelle is an established contributor to the field of digital culture as an educator, curator, writer, and artist. Her next project, The Architecture of the Temporary, kicks off at the Scottish Architecture Fringe in uh, this month, I guess, or is possibly even gone by now, uh, but you can tell us more. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, thanks for that. I'm going to share my screen. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, and tell you a bit about my project that I created. Uh, BB. So uh, BB is uh, really a, a love letter that I wrote. Um, it's a word that comes from uh, the Dutch words uh, Burt for neighborhood and uh, a shortening of bibliotheek, which means library. Um, and the Burt Beebs are the spontaneously organized multilingual communal neighborhood bookshelves of Amsterdam where I live. The Burt Beeb is a, I would say, beloved uh, Dutch cultural object. And in its most simple form, uh, a Burt Beeb is uh, simply a bookshelf or some other piece of furniture that gets left on the street where anyone can take a book or leave a book. Uh, and sometimes other items creep in, toys or puzzles or even leftover food. Um, I've seen a wide range of things, always useful things. Um, and the contents of the Bird Beeb, uh, especially the books, have an incredible range, I would say, from things like outdated tech manuals. Uh, there's a lot of the for dummies and the other kind of series there unfortunately not of the most recent technology, um, to things like uh, children's books, uh, some Bert, Bert Beebe specialize in children's books actually, um, and romance novels and well, Eat, Pray, Love, anyone? It's, a <laughs> it's still available, I think, on this one outside. Um, they're also noticeably uh, multilingual, which I love. Um, the books are mostly in Dutch, uh, of course, in uh, Amsterdam where I live, but um, one can uh, also easily find titles in many other languages. English uh, is a common one, French, German, Italian, um, many more. Uh, interestingly, I've also noted, noted a lot of books about uh, language instruction. Uh, and I've been sorely tempted to pick up that Berlitz guide to Finnish or Hungarian or whatever, just for, just for kicks, for example. Uh, it's, the Burt Beeb is a temporary street architecture uh, which moves and changes. The simplest one is just a crate balanced on the wall like this uh, or a spare bookshelf pulled onto the street. Some are more planned with doors that close, ornate paint jobs and signage like this one uh, that closes at night and uh, is clearly marked as our neighbor Philip's Beeb. Uh, you can buy quite fancy ones online as well if you don't feel like making one yourself to install in your neighborhood or if you don't have a spare Billy bookshelf. You, you would think that these things would be quite chaotic and there would be a lot of trash and garbage uh, that would accumulate, uh, but it's extremely rare to spot a beeb that's been taken over by junk or that's spilling into the street. Usually the, the many hands of the neighborhood make the beeb tidy and keep it full of mostly books and other occasional useful things. Of course, it's not it's not just a Dutch thing um, there. You know, these are documented as as being in numerous other cities across the globe. It's a kind of a universal thing. Um, but I've had some time to, to look at the, the trend as it unfolds here. And what's striking about it is that it's so popular. If you uh, walk around, just go walk for a little while in a, any given residential neighborhood, it wouldn't be strange to come across several of these. And it also fits well with other informal sharing mechanisms here, like we have the, the Kringlofwinkel, a place where wide range of objects like clothing, furniture, 
uh, appliances, cookware can be dropped off and, and either picked up for free or purchased for a very low price. So there's a really active um, attitude towards sharing going on here. Uh, during the Low Carbon Design Institute uh, talk given by Rebecca Trevelyan, she asked the audience to uh, meditate on and to share what they thought of when they thought of the phrase sharing economy. And uh, I, d I uh, didn't speak up, but just reflected in the text chat that uh, to me, it had become mostly a buzz phrase that was useful cover for socially and ethically dubious platforms. It led me to think of uh, Airbnb in particular, a sharing platform that's done extreme damage to Amsterdam's neighborhoods to the point where the city has been forced to really heavily regulate the use of the platform. Uh, I, I could go into details there if you want, but it's really very interesting the, the measures that they've had to take to combat the way that Airbnb has uh, done damage to the, to the really um, pressed uh, housing market here. And so I was really struck by, by the Burt Beeb and what it represents as being something really rare in its simplicity and purity. It's a, a popular form of sharing and in particular knowledge sharing and it works and it's unfunded and unregulated by anyone in particular. I've been photographing these sites for a long time, kind of informally capturing dozens of them on my smartphone and then uploading them to my Instagram. Um, but the opportunity that this residency provided uh, compelled me to go back and take some more better shots with my trusty Nikon. And I intend to continue to revisit and reshoot these sites to better document them. I then took some of the photos and rasterized them and experimented with riso printing different representations of the Burt Beep locations overlaid with text. Um, I considered multiple options here. I was thinking of uh, using a laser uh, a laser cutter to engrave uh, book, the book covers and then put the books back on the shelves and things like this. Um, uh, but that didn't strike me, the, the fumes it creates are so toxic. It didn't strike me as very in tune uh, with the, the aims of the residency. So I settled on riso printing um, because it's one of the most environmentally responsible printing options. It's a cold process and it uses soy-based inks. Um, it's also prone to error and not archival uh, in the least. So uh, that also kind of appealed to me as being in tune with the spirit of the Burt Beeb since uh, they themselves are, are temporary and unpredictable structures. So the lastly, uh, the lastly, the thing I tried was to treat the Burt Beeb as a kind of uh, network, broadcasting network, so to speak, that I could use to, uh, to publish as a publishing platform uh, by making a zine. So over the coming weeks, um, I'm curating and distributing texts around a lot of the themes that we explored in this uh, residency, environmental responsibility, notions of prosperity, abundance, uh, personal responsibility. Um, and then once I've assembled these texts, uh, I'll put a riso printed cover on, on the zine and distribute them through the local Burt Beebs. And it, in my uh, dreams, uh, in my mind anyways, with several copies in circulation to unknown parties, I imagine that the, the readers of this zine become a kind of um, decentralized brain trust or reading group. I'm just, I guess, I'm trying to plant seeds in my neighbor's minds really and get them thinking about some of these issues as well and share some of the knowledge that I've uh, gained over the course of this residency. Um, I just want to say thanks once again to, to Alex and to all of the fellows in my cohort. It's been a really special and impactful residency for me, due in no small part to the conversations that we've shared. So thank you again. Thank you, Michelle. Um, fantastic uh, presentation, fantastic work as well. Can you talk about the uh, importance for you of the locality and the uh, the hyper local nature of the project, because of course, one tendency could have been for you to collect um, uh, BBs everywhere and to you know collect a kind of communal. And in the chat, people have been sharing where their local mini library, mini free library exists. Uh, what was it about kind of staying hyper local that was so important to you? Yeah, they really become a fabric of the street. Um, and I've, I've um, been documenting them for a long time and I've noticed them there for a while. I noticed uh, the first one that I showed that was the three uh, boxes um, was actually a much more informal structure and somebody actually improved it uh, and, and made it kind of nicer and better. So I really, uh, I've seen them in many cities around the world. I'm, um, uh, I've 
traveled all over and, and, and keep running into structures like this. But what struck me was the, the loving care that they get here. And so I thought it was really important to, uh, to document that. I feel like there are many aspects of Amsterdam that are rapidly changing. Um, uh, the neighborhood I live in is, uh, has gentrified immensely um, in the 10 years that I've uh, lived here. And I think that um, all of these things need to be, uh, to be shared, documented. We need to understand um, the things that work, the things that work and don't, uh, if, it, you know, if it ain't broke, uh, don't fix it kind of thing. Like to, it would be a shame if part of gentrification meant that these, that these kind of random street structures got cleaned up somehow or something like that. It's, uh, I, I feel it like it's, it's an important part of a kind of uh, fragile cultural heritage that I, I feel an urgency to document as Amsterdam gentrifies. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. I think we're gonna uh, move on again uh, with an eye on the clock, but thank you for sharing your project. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move us on to Priya. Uh, Priya is a designer slash tech inventor building nature-based systems in partnership with global organizations seeking to accelerate shifts in their business model in the context of climate change. She's also the jury president for impact in the 2021 DNAD awards and on deck climate tech fellow. In this work, um, Priya is interested in exploring the future of plant-based carbon free computing and more. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Priya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And sorry, that was a mouthful. I was a bit ambitious when I was writing my proposal. Now, when I think about it, if I realized <laughs> we have time to do all of that. So anyway, always try and be more ambitious than the time one, one gets. Um, a big hello to people in the in the crowd as well. Nice to see some familiar faces. So I'm today just going to share my um, journey on how I ended up in this residency and a bit of my background. I've been previously designing like systems and I have a, a bias of looking at systems everywhere, not typically operating systems. So when I signed up for this residency, I was very keen to kind of basically challenge myself and start seeing things much more on a holistic perspective and see how things are connected without this kind of classic silos that we tend to have um, across like humans and machines and non-humans. And I was trying to really see what was the kind of interlying, the, the thread that brings us all together. Prior to this, I had done the on-deck climate tech residency, which was a valley-based thing, and it was a strong focus on technology, and I was really missing conversations with more critical colleagues in the design industry, and it was really wonderful coming back to the fold, and Alex for giving me an opportunity, so thanks for that. Um, so Lucy and I and a couple of others uh, in, our, in our enthusiasm in the early days wanted to create a manifesto, which we didn't manage to get it all together, but I was somehow wanted to work my ancient graphic design skills and start making some posters because I love making posters. And one of the things which I wanted to do was basically come up with a kind of commitment, like a couple of others have mentioned, of what are the kind of things I'd like to explore. So removing this distinction between us and them, human and nature, human and machine was quite important. Also this idea which came from um, Emma about how not to be boring and to keep it sexy, that was something that was quite fascinating as well. And the whole idea of trying to elicit conversations with people who you typically wouldn't have conversations or even things and or organisms, how would you actually listen better to see what's going on? So I came up with this short kind of um, a short video to talk about the process a bit and my reflections from a bunch of sketches. I challenged myself to use lots of watercolors and sketching like a couple of others have try and get away from the screen and these were basically like reflections from the talks that Alex had wonderfully curated together and this one is basically all of us trying to understand the climate problem but almost like the classic people looking at the elephant and seeing different parts of the issue and I think this first week for me was just about grounding up and the bunch of questions that I kind of um, gleaned from that was basically in each of these weeks from the talks I ended up in this, in, so rather than trying to think about what were the kind of um, problems and solutions, is what are the questions that are being asked and what questions would remain in my mind after a conversation. And maybe I've got grumpy over the years, but this thing about why design still continues to haunt me and the question of why do something and how do you still remain positive because there's so much of things where the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So the why design stayed in the back of my head and I thought, okay, so this is the week two and 
I'm currently living a, a rather nomadic life, as some of you guys know. So it was quite interesting for me to take each neighborhood where I was living each week and see what I can do there and then and look at the neighborhood like a couple of others have done, almost like a lab, and then kind of extrapolate from there to take some um, ideas and themes on a scale level. So one of the things that came out was this concept that happened also during the pandemic is people's urge to connect with nature. And we seem to spend a lot of time in nature in general. And I was quite fascinated, like all the parks that I went to, there was almost like, like a lot of people have spoken of having kind of a public kind of common space where you don't have to constantly consume and buy and purchase things. But funny enough, people are in the old way consuming. They're consuming this nature, which we need to actually kind of consider, not take it for granted. And um, the other thing which I noticed because I was living close to Regent's Park was the, the London Zoo, which is quite fascinating, it almost felt like a like a temple or altar for the giraffes where people would wait quite patiently for these two giraffes to come out. And that made me think about the religious experience as well. I know a couple of people, writers have thought, spoken from William Blake to um, Thoreau have spoken about how nature gives almost this kind of a connection and religious experience. But I was quite interested in seeing how, how could we actually build upon that. And um, oops, I just don't know why this is not moving forward. I'm having some issues with my, oh, there we go. I think it's Zoom, I guess. Oops. Okay, now it's working, sorry. Yeah, so based upon that, I kind of used the semiotic square, um, which is a really interesting tool uh, come up by. Um, it started from looking at Aristotle's uh, format of how you look at logic and meaning and was um, made by this guy called Grayman. And in the in this uh, semiotic square, I wanted to actually understand and unpack the meaning of nature and the, unpack the meaning of life itself and the concept of life and death. So the way it works is you take a concept like life, the direct opposite is death. And then you take contrary terms, which is not death, not life. And then you look at the implications of it to see what are the kind of possibilities of new kinds of relationships that one can explore. And for me, it was really very much about this idea of, OK, if, if the smallest unit is an organism, which is a spore, a mushroom, and then you have things like, you know, the cyclical aspect of nature. So death is not bad. It's about renewal. And that's what and typically the, the whole industry has been traditionally been charged is like using fossils and reusing what is what has been there in the ground. And then from there, you have this concept of not death, not life, which is the higher level order of consciousness and intelligence. So I was quite interested on, on mixing and matching these things. And one of the games I came up with is this what if game, which is a classic tool. But I was just thinking, what if we just embedded nature into man-made systems like quite radically and right from energy to like, you know, um, superheroes, for example. So like if there was a political party, it'd be the climate party. If it was knowledge, it'd be indigenous. If it was love, it'll be like inter post polyamorous across species. And identity will always be changing. It'll be evolving. It's not like binary or even a, a range or spectrum. It's, it's based across age groups as well. So from there, I got fascinated with the concept of um, nature and religion. So I went into my into this space and started saying, okay, how does religion actually organize uh, belief systems? And I was looking at, I mean, this is a quite a um, well-known uh, model from Donella Meadows, the iceberg model, and trying to understand what our belief systems are and how that shapes our mental models and what kinds of patterns and behaviors end up as a result. So the way I was looking at it is if we can look at what people choose to believe or what they're asked to believe, and what is the philosophy driving that, then perhaps we could think about imagining a new kind of system and relationship with nature. So I then ended up going in my neighborhood and looking at what was going on on the streets in terms of belief systems. So I came across a Falun Gong protester and I, while I was running, this was basically doing my runs, meditated with her for some time just to understand why she's in the sun sitting and doing this day in and day out. Also passing the mosque and listening to the azan um, actually going to a church uh, sermon in, in Regent Street. And um, I have never been to this particular church or sermon. I was quite fascinating that they were quite welcoming. And it was it was interesting to see why all these people are congregating. And I could get a sense that once you're interconnected 
and people feel there's a level of relationship through something they believe in, you feel like they're, they're, that you're almost like on an organism level on a higher order. And you could see that also being manifested by um, beliefs of um, of people coming in the technology itself, like this um, this company which does digital sabbath for Christian technology and the Sharia law um, based uh, banking for Islamic banking without interest. So I kind of wanted to just take this idea to its conclusion and this is what I came up with. So imagine it's 1st November and you're given a choice to the UK Verify Government Service to select a religion and you select nature. You can choose your family, which can be humans and non-humans. And you can also say where they are located. So that could be in your public park. And then you go and pay them a visit. And this idea of park as a platform as well, where you see the interconnections. But it was already dead, wasn't it? It's probably helping cleaning the, the pond. It's a dead pigeon. So one of the things that came up during pandemic was also that people unfortunately left a lot of litter in places of natural beauty including parks and the parks everywhere but could not even deal with the amount of litter so my question really is if nature is a religion then can it change our behavior because the way we would relate to nature because we are part of it and we would respect it and worship it in a way whereby it just changes our unsustainable behaviors going forward so i have a petition which i set up yesterday and it's looking for signatures to kind of see whether we would have new kinds of uh, social contracts and behaviors that we could have, which is actually going to help us create a better relationship with nature going forward. So I'll, I'll put it in the chat. It'll be great to see whether you guys want to sign it up. Thank you, Priya. Um, we uh, have maybe uh, one or two minutes for questions. My question to you it's just, uh, there's obviously a litany of thoughts that you've had during the residency, which um, sort of direction do you think you'll explore more in this nature as a nature as a religion? What would be, if you had uh, two, three extra weeks, what would be your uh, focus? So what I was trying to really do there is see nature as a religion could be a lever for behavior change and new kinds of relationships and, and contracts. So I'm really hoping to take this further with looking at the whole nature as a, as a as a connected whole and see all the different kind of uh things that we would interact right from our mobile phone and and the the kind of you know cloud computing services we use if we actually put nature as a as together on the same level how would that relationship change from the way we look at energy consumption to how we relate to the way we are in nature in a park so i'm trying to look at it almost from a from a neighborhood level to like a scale infrastructure level. So that's what I would be interested in doing interventions at each each part. Amazing, thank you so much, Priya. Um, again, uh, just looking at the time, I'm gonna have to move us on to Sara. Um, hopefully Sara is with us. Um, Sara is a full-time learner and volunteer exploring a career in using effective design and communications for social good. Um, she loves facilitating community experiences that bring people together to learn, play, and just be and is currently volunteering with the Global Shapers community in India. Hello, Sara. Hey, everyone. Let me share my screen. Um, is my screen visible? Yes, it is.
All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sara. A um, couple of uh, introductions before I begin. Uh, I think at least in this presentation, you can really sit back and probably enjoy a piece of poetry because that's just what my work is. Uh, I think probably as the youngest, as well as professionally the youngest person in the cohort, I had a lot of freedom to not think about uh, a, a particular sector or industry or you know certain principles of design. So I went all over the place. And since uh, someone just getting into the design world, uh, what I came to the residency is with a lot of questions and I went, what I go back with is also a lot of questions. So, um, so the love of storytelling and human experience, uh, I, I chose poetry uh, and storytelling as a format of uh, collecting my thoughts. Uh, and as I said, I came around with a lot of important questions, which a lot of people uh, who have done presentations before have asked, um, who should we really hold responsible for climate change? Um, how do we design interventions that facilitate transfer of power and not concentrate it even more? How do we include the most excluded voices in our climate change action? So my poem is called Whose Crisis? Um, this is from a perspective of someone sitting in a developing country and kind of seeing reality there. And uh, I hope you like it. So everyone's talking about climate change. I guess I should too. They say it's a massive and urgent crisis. Though some days it makes me wonder crisis for whom? So if the number of meals you can afford to eat today count on the luck and whims of the employer who owns you, and if you had to go home another day, just like yesterday, with only bread for the children after a 17-hour workday, this may not be your crisis. If your home lies somewhere between one refugee camp to another, the sky is your roof, barbed wires for walls, some camper vans brought your kids dinner tonight. If your children see dreams that don't let them sleep anymore and play with the resurrected remains of toys, buried under rubble and stone, this may not be your crisis. If you're that one in global, globally one in three, braving the walk into a dark field every night, navigating creatures and sometimes an unwelcome passerby, all just to relieve yourself once more, this may not be your crisis. If you've lived 60 years of life, feet on earth, you speak the language of the trees and call the forest your home. You live and breathe the word Mother Earth. Our existential crisis is not worthy of that name anymore. So this may not be your crisis. So if this is no one's crisis, what is the crisis anymore? What is it? Why does it make so much noise? And is it even a conversation if there's only one single voice? Who does this crisis belong to after all? Maybe it belongs inside the red tapes, the round tables, the teleprompters and blindingly lit newsrooms. It just, it must belong there carefully stacked up in the science book section of the library or hidden in the tiny spaces between bar graphs in the newly release uh, of the IPCC report. Maybe it belongs in the glass clad geoengineering labs behind the doors of Tibet rooms in documentaries on dying polar bears and wilting coral reefs, or most probably in the solar sauna room, that vegan leather bag store, and the hot clubhouse discussion on do humans really deserve survival anymore? So I don't know everything about climate change yet, but this one-sided crisis conversation is not really working anymore. It speaks a language and a tone that sounds so unfamiliar and so unknown to the very people whose crises often go unseen, whose voices get muffled by even louder screams, yet the same people whose lives will be wounded the most as the forecasts of today become reality tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was absolutely fantastic. Can I ask you to reflect a little bit on the choice of um, both what you shared with us, but also the format? Sure. Um, what I shared, uh, I think, in, spec in specific to the format, is kind of, kind of, capture snippets from people's lives. Um, I'd like to share screen again just to sh 
probably let people observe the news, uh, so the art that's that's um, in I've relation. Also, uh, I've also linked to the page directly, so they can also zoom into those images on your project page. Yeah. Um, uh, the picture that you see, the women there are actually people from the Adivasi community or they are the tribal communities from India. And um, I, I, what I have done is basically taken snippets from newspapers, from The Guardian, from Indian news, news uh, papers and kind of pasted it against their faces and kind of their background just to show what are the contradictions of how we talk to people about climate change and kind of give a, give a visual to it. So um, I think I've kind of tried to explore a number of questions here. How do we solve climate change without including humans in it or separating communities? Um, for example, the, the black box shows you how 10,000s of slum dwelling people were removed from the forest land because they wanted to conserve the forest land. Or when there's a development project, you remove people there and why, why should they care about climate change? And there are a lot of relevant questions. Is this the crisis for everyone? Uh, when you live in a, when you live a life where the crisis is an everyday meal or the crisis is, um, you know, are your kids being able to go to school tomorrow? Does it even matter? So how do we talk to people and bring more people um, in the conversation without excluding them is, is something that I've been I have to think about, I guess. That's fantastic, Sarah. I really want to uh, thank you for this piece. I think it, it's incredibly powerful. I also want to um, especially underline that Sarah joined us from India on this residency, uh, which is um, predominantly was um, mostly UK attendees. Um, but I'm really, really pleased that you could take the time and you could take the space uh, and also create such powerful work. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move us on to uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, are you here with us? Uh, just a quick uh, introduction to Rebecca. She's an artist and researcher based in London. Her work investigates social and ecological and political conditions in relation to human and more than human experiences of light and dark. Hello, can you hear me? Great. I've got a slightly unstable connection, so I've got my video off. But let me try and share my screen and see what happens. Can you see my PDF? Great. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, just to uh, give a bit of detail, I'm a, a white woman in my 30s and I have brown wavy hair. You can see me in a picture here wearing a green safety hat and an orange high-vis boiler suit. Um, I'm an artist and researcher and I co-direct an organization called Lumen Studios based in London and Margate. And with my co-directors, Melanie and Louise, I organize exhibitions, events and workshops which we use to have conversations about astronomy, light and light pollution. So I'm gonna talk a, a bit about that ongoing work and um, how the residency, how the Low Carbon Design Institute residency helped me get a different perspective on my work beyond a pure arts and theory dialogue. Um, so um, I spent a few re years researching darkness and light pollution uh, I'm doing this because I'm interested in how experiences of and practices during darkness and night can differ and change depending on where and who we are. So looking at both rural locations and also in a city like London or Birmingham, here you can see Birmingham New Street um, on the left and an image of a tree illuminated in that street. Um, that's from October 2020. And I'm interested in uh, artificial light pollution and sky glow because of what it can tell us about our changing relationship with the night over time and the impact we could be having on not just our immediate spaces, but also places much further away that are under the gaze of this diffuse light. Um, I worked with a, let me just check my screen here. I worked with a, uh, a researcher called Andy Yekov who defines sky glow as a form of indirect light pollution that originates from light radiated upwards and then is scattered back within the atmosphere. 
Uh, it depends on the weather conditions like clouds and snow cover, and it can reach illuminance levels brighter than a full moon um, in and nearby urban areas. So during lockdown, I started to make images and films in my garden of the night sky, became very aware and attuned to different kinds of light around me from car headlights to blue ambulance flashes against the bricks of my house and the lights of the building next to me and so on. Um, I also noticed other lights like security lights flashing and realized that they were tracing the movements of foxes playing between gardens. And so I became more interested in these more than human sounds and activities, and which gave me a heightened sense that I wasn't alone in this space. And I wanted to explore that further across um, ecosystems. So <laughs> during my, um, during the, uh, the residency we've just done, I took part in a bat walk at Walthamstow Wetlands. And I found that brighter streetlights can, um, can attract insects the bats, bats feed on and so reduce the food available for bats in the usual feeding areas. Um, on further research, I found that uh, work um, by researchers in the, at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology at the University of Wageningen had helped um, implement red lighting in a sustainable community in the Netherlands and created a safer night sky for specific species in that locality. Um, and so as part of forthcoming research, uh, I'll be doing uh, at Abney Cemetery Park in Hackney with three other um, artists and designers. I hope to um, explore the lighting around the park and in the what they call the edge lands, so the, the lighting bordering the, the site. And um, so during the resident, this residency, I also uh, did some walks there in the evening and these are some images from dusk. Um, and so just to quickly sum up the thinking that I <laughs> got from the residency, um, I wanted to come up with some kind of like guiding principles and commitments to my work and thinking with the nighttime. I mean, they're in more detail on the website if Alex has put the link. Um, but these sort of way I'm thinking about my work is how can I democratize this academic research that I've been looking at for the last few years. In my experience, like working with scientists has been ch very challenging and I'm very sort of like embedded in this research process, but how can I bring this into the site that I'm looking at um, in a way that's accessible? And uh, so, and the second one is knowledge thickening, which I think is an interesting concept around um, thinking with, for me that involves thinking with, a sit with situated practices of a place and, and listening to voices from that place. Um, and developing different ontologies for addressing environmental change in that way. So looking at local community insight into nighttime ecologies around and within the park um, as a starting point rather than as a means to fill a gap, um, gap of knowledge. Um, thinking about time differently beyond a human centered scale. So looking at the history of the park and it's um, begins as a colonial arboretum and how that site has changed over time um, and it's sort of when it became a disused space and then reinvigorated again and how that space has then become really pivotal over the past year for the local community during the lockdown uh, as an, an alternative green space. Um, uh, thinking about a meaningful, meaningful way to work with the plurality of night experience. So um, thinking back to earlier this year, the conversation that, that began or, can, or sort of became even sort of greater after um, the tragic circumstances around Sarah Everard, um, sort of the, the idea around feeling safe within the night is really a privilege that shouldn't be needed to be a privilege. Um, so encouraging practices of, uh, when I've been reading uh, information around re like rewilding the self um, and have been able to go out into the night sky go out and experience the night sky. We have to also think about ways to create a safe experience to do that for all bodies. Um, so looking at how we address these gaps and narrow uncertainties around the night. And lastly, developing um, uh, sound practices of care in response to how technologies and processes are used to quantify and find value in, in, value in biodiversity and subsequent claims for and on wild land. Um, and looking at how these sort of technocratic approaches can also invisibilize and make vulnerable certain species in the process of that study. 
So <laughs> I'm going to end with a quote. I don't know if you can actually see it. Hopefully you can. Um, by a researcher, Susan Shipley, from her text. And she talks in reference to Isabel Stengers and says, researchers, uh, Stengers argues, must accept the possibility that it is not man, but the material that asks questions, that has a story to tell, which one has to learn to unravel. I propose a somewhat more potent reading of Stengers in which the material not only has the power to make and bear, bear witness to history, but also brazenly speaks back. And I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Rebecca. That's fantastic. Can you reflect a little bit on, um, I guess, what uh, in the context of the residency sort of shaped your work? Because obviously this is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing theme in your practice. Uh, what was it about taking these four weeks that you thought was the most impactful on your ideas? Um, I think uh, for me it was, um, I think Jeremy's talk about rewilding um, was quite impactful. Um, because I think I'd been so, a lot of the literature and um, conversation around rewilding for me had sort of been very particular and Jeremy's approach to rewilding was about sort of rewilding the self and sort of it being sort of about the connection you make with yourself rather than sort of this sort of like idea of nature. And then this also came up during the bat walk that I did and the, the writer who gave a reading was talking about getting attuned to the night and rewilding the self in the night. So um, I think those are kind of like critical things. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do love Jeremy. I just saw Lucy's comment. Um, so those are kind of like critical things for me um, in that I hadn't really thought about the concept or notion of rewilding in relation to my work before in the night sky. And it, and it became apparent that a lot of the dialogue around rewilding doesn't really think, well, that I've seen so far, unless anyone can show me more. So um, doesn't have much to do with like nighttime, nighttime ecologies and ecosystems. So that's what I'm interested in looking at further. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank I'm you. Gonna move on to Shirley. Uh, Shirley is a sculptor and digital artist working with AIR. Her interactive works have been shown at the Royal Academy London, Tate Exchange and Tate Lates. Hello, Shirley. Hello. Good to see you. I'm struggling a little bit with um, pressing lots of buttons. Hopefully um, it will go well. But um, my response to um, the Your Carbon Design Institute, which has been really invigorating, is um, it was to create a world news at noon. So it, it's, it launched today. And um, let me just show you. Um, Probably best I show you. So it's a five minute news bulletin, and if I can share the video, I will do it now. Because.
and I think, I think it's just stopped. Not sure. Yeah, we we didn't get um, we didn't get any sound, unfortunately. So we'll have to point people to the video at some later stage, I think. Um, okay. But uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the piece? Okay, so what it was, it's um. Let me show you my. See if I can show you something else. <clears throat> Might help explain. Can you see this? Can I? So this is my. Can you see anything? Not right this second. Yeah. Now hmm. yes. Okay, so this is my um, broadcast unit that I set up. So it's a solar powered broadcast unit to feed the new supply of the world population numbers to well, to the networks of Earth. So there's been a lot of talk during our residency about the Earth cannot talk. And that, I found that really stuck in my mind. Um, I do think obviously that the Earth has lots of networks and systems, but we're not necessarily listening or not able to always connect with every single network we're used to being like the, the master of the universe, but maybe we're not at all. So anyway, this is um, this is my little makeshift broadcast unit and um, I'm able to feed these figures. So it reports um, instant information, so live data on births and deaths throughout the world. It rises um, quite dramatically, and um, and that's really kind of that's really where I was with that. I think um, there's some Dr. OJ mentioned a lot about systems. He said they affect you, human and not non-human, visible, hidden, invisible powers, and also um, Adam um, Hardy. He mentioned that the average citizen thinks government's going to take care of all this. Uh, but then I also thought of Luke Nicholson, who mentioned that it's easy to feel overwhelmed by something as big as climate. Um, and, and I do, I came into this program feeling useless. And I think I still feel a sense of uselessness. And this piece here is useless. It's not doing much, but it is um, it's, it's making me act differently. It's making me act, think greener. It's um, taking back some hope. And um, I think the person who really struck me was Michelle Thorne, who she really did say, take hope back. And do we, do we really need to like, you know, think about what we can do? We can rethink everything and reject boundaries and rethink how we're going to live our lives before some other forces start telling us how we have to, either nature or government or you know, just powerful forces of technology or, you know, the usual. Um, but I suppose overall, I was thinking, is any art, any data, any entertainment worth ruining the life for? And um, so if I believe that, then I thought I have to do something. So that's why I started this, this way to try to start connecting myself to the earth a bit more through technology and data, which is all around us and is all part of our lives. So I wanted to be able to use what we've got because tech, tech can be useful, data can be useful. but maybe sometimes too useful because maybe we want to be adding some more do we really need everything to be there for us at all times easily available 24 7. um so that's um where i got up to um and it's still ongoing there's i, I worked on another project as well which was a a sound work talking to the earth trying to talk to it in different frequencies um all overlapping and interacting something that came out of this program is that the, the way forward seems to be cyclical there's this, lots of circles and loops and bubbles that's kind of where if we can start thinking if i can as an artist start thinking about not having dead ends and not just putting something out there that doesn't um come back then at least i'm doing my one little thing and i think feeling small is part of this whole process um, we are small, but and we are useless. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. when we come all together, um, if we scale it up, as um, Timothy Morton says, if we scale everything up, there's a billion people who do one thing, and that can have an impact either way. So, yeah, that's where I got for it. Thank you so much, Shirley. That's absolutely fantastic. And um, just to, uh, I encourage you, if you can, to also listen to. Uh, Shirley's piece, Hello World, which I've just posted on the, um, the chat. 
I'm going to move us on to last, but absolutely not least, um, Julie, uh, Julie works with real-time data and living systems to create artwork that encompasses animation, soundscape, sculpture, and installation. Her project, Invisible Cape, directly addresses the need to reimagine and redesign online culture to work towards a zero-carbon web. She's a TED Senior Fellow and co-founder of Fine Acts, a platform for art and activism. Thank you so much, Julie, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I just, you know, it's been such a privilege to listen to everyone, uh, to all the talks and residency, and just to listen to everyone's responses. I mean, it's just the multiplicity of of ideas and different like comprehensions that have come out of it is just astounding. And actually, that's uh, it's kind of indicative of how climate change really does touch everyone in completely different ways. Um, so I am gonna. Just share my screen, but I, I just wanted to talk about. There's two two projects that I kind of came up with, and um, I've had one big overriding um, thought throughout this residency that was really triggered by um, Chris Adams's uh, talk about technology. And I've I came to the residency uh, very much with. Just get my. very much with an idea about, um, is that full screen? No, it's not, not yet. No, yeah. I came to the residency with very much this idea of um, looking at technology and, and how we can reduce carbon emissions through technology and what, what that would mean to different people. But this, this idea of convenience has bubbled up. I feel like in nearly every single talk for me, I've managed to kind of like draw a thread and um, and and what and then what even does convenience mean, and what are the consequences of convenience for one person versus convenience for other people? And one of the reasons that this has become slightly obsessive for me is that we've in the work that I'm doing with my new organisation, Invisible Cape. One of the things we're trying to do is to convince people that what they think they want is something to do with their convenience and what's gone before. Um, and how do we get people to pay for us to do things in a different way, a different way, which takes longer, is therefore more expensive, but is also um, results in something that is perceived to be compromised. And um, we, in, so it is an inconvenience. So it's a kind of it is a real challenge, and I think that's at the heart of a lot of um, climate change issue, issues and the sort of the, the slowness and the syrupiness of the way that. Um, we're moving to try and um, reach the, the Paris Agreement. So I, I came up initially with an idea that was uh, about how could you point people towards what is convenient and what isn't. And because I make a lot of online artworks, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll make an online artwork which uses data as a form of energy. And um, it takes the energy of the audience, their attention energy, if you like, converts it into data and then makes a generative animation. Um, but before they can see that, before they get to be get to be shown what it is, they have to wait a web page. And until they've got another 10 people to join them, they can't see the work. And the idea being that kind of like in theater, a performer would hold their performance for one person and then wait until everyone's arrived. And then they give their energy to everyone all at once. And it makes it kind of worth doing. So with an online artwork, the server doesn't spin up until there is enough people there to make it worthwhile um, using that energy to show them the artwork. And in exchange, the, number, the numbers of the audience get sort of folded into the artwork. And so over time, it gets more complex as it sort of gets more energy from that attention. And I was thinking, this is, this is great. I'm going to try and make it as part of the residency. I'm gonna try and make it in time for the deadline. And then I realized that actually I was just tripping on my own thoughts because it would be really convenient to make it in time, but I couldn't because the, the, the tools weren't there. And then it made me realize that actually, is there any point in making it if I can just describe the concept? And then if I did make it and I did put this kind of layer of inconvenience in, 
is actually that is that okay and we had a, we had some really powerful talks on the last day which made me kind of reflect on what is convenient to one person is maybe inconvenient to another. So the convenience for one person has inconvenient consequences for somebody else, maybe in another location, and also for the planet. And, and this kind of idea that um, convenience is one of the main drivers of a sort of accelerated climate change became quite, it, it became just something that just started to unravel. So we hop on a plane because we wanna get somewhere quicker that's an issue. We want food from all over the world. So we're in a system where we can do that. But, and that's also a problem. We can't be bothered to carry a reusable bag. So we invented plastic bags. We have, you know, even things like having water directly to our homes. So we use more water because it's easy to access because it's convenient because it comes out of a tap. It means that we're exploiting our resources maybe more than we need to. And so I, I could begin to see these threads of convenience uh, in everything. So, and the work, the work itself, even down to, if I'm holding somebody up at a website and saying, you need to find a bunch of other audience members before you can see it. What if that person, what if they don't have any friends? What if they can't use their data to contact someone else? What if that becomes something that is um, about a lack of accessibility rather than an inconvenience. And so I just kind of tripped myself up um, in questioning everything so much. And I think that I, I love the idea of the, atten the attention to energy exchange, but I don't like the idea of inconvenience in someone for the sake of talking about convenience. Anyway, I, you know, not quite sure where I was going. But one of the things that is definitely came out of it is this idea of doing it all slower just to sort of slow down, make sure you consider all of these elements before you proceed and make anything, a piece of artwork or whatever it might be. And is it really progress or is it just pushing convenience even further? So I came up with something that was really low, low-fi, low-tech, and it's a series of these, these kind of just simple black and white um, graphics, they're SVGs, they're really tiny in terms of data, they take very little energy when they're being sent around. And I thought about um, what is the, what's happening at the moment where there's a lot of energy debate online in terms of technology, and I ended up at cryptocurrencies and NFTs, and there's a huge debate around that. And actually there's some of the cryptocurrency world has become very much it's almost like a religion. It's all be, must become a faith where people are really kind of believe in this way of democratizing the buying and selling of art. And so I explored a platform called Hick and Nunk. And this platform is one of the kind of greener options. It uses a different way of um, generating it, the cryptocurrency. The Tezos is generated um, using proof of stake instead of proof of work, which is vastly reduces the energy needed to generate the, the coins. But when I looked into it, and it actually kind of resonated because this hick and nunk is Latin for here and now, and this kind of like idea that we want to satisfy a desire of I need it here, uh, I want it now. And so it, it, it became particularly pertinent to do it on that particular platform. So what I thought was I'll release these works, a very idealistic, release the works, and then people can, for really cheaply, like 25p each, people can buy them and then sell them. And what I'd do is track the energy of that artwork and see how far it would go and um, get ask people to literally give away the thing that they've taken. And this idea of exchange, so it all becomes all about um, a way of uh, the energy that you hold is temporary and fleeting and momentary and that you have to learn to let it go. We can't keep holding on to things. You have to keep passing everything on. And that includes the energy that we're using. And we have to learn to do that quickly. So I set up these works and you can buy them all individually. And what happened was that um, a whole bunch of them got bought and immediately the people that bought them whacked the price up and then they sat on the secondary market for um, 20, some of them 20 times more than their original price. And then of course it stopped. That's because no one's going to pay that much for, um, for something uh, 
that, that has kind of gone beyond the concept that it was originally designed for. So it was an interesting experiment to see some people pass them on, to see some people, even friends of mine saying, no, I'm not going to let go. I can't let go. I want to keep your first NFT artwork. And then other people just took part in the game and, and carried on. So I think one of the, one of the, I don't know, one of the, the things that I am really struck by with anything on the, with cryptocurrencies and this idea of the debris that is left behind. So I can follow the journey that all of these works have gone through. And that is like a, a sort of permanent data trail. And it's almost like the, what's left, these blockchains that are getting bigger and larger and collecting all of this information all of the time are kind of like single use plastics of the internet. They're just cluttering up servers. They're just everywhere and they're just growing. And the whole point is that they persist. And actually that's not really what we want online. And so how can we begin to do things differently? And then this morning I was thinking about the project and I was thinking that I feel like I've just become part of something that I'm kind of a little bit anti. And I came back to this idea of giving people access and taking it away. And then I was walking by the beach and the, there's a tidal pool outside my house. And I love fresh water, seawater swimming. And when the tide is high, the pool disappears and we can't swim. And then when the tide goes down two hours either side of high tide, the pool is revealed and we can, we can go swimming in it. And I love that. I love that there's this kind of ebb and flow of the times when I'm allowed and I'm not allowed to do something. And I fit my life around that. And it doesn't feel inconvenient. It feels like, it feels like a gift, this idea of inconvenience being a gift. And so I, I think that that's what I'm going to hold on to, the idea that when I'm talking to people and something isn't convenient, that we say and we frame it as that actually is a gift because it means we have to do something different. We have to think in a different way. We have to change, change in, um, we have to compromise, but it's a good thing. Compromise is a good thing. And then just to finish, I was just fiddling around today and I didn't release this work yet, but I think in the future when everyone's looking back, over the kind of huge um, exploitation of energy that's happened around NFTs. I think um, t-shirts with things like I never mind written on will be something that people will gonna <laughs> want to wear and be proud to be part of. So I just want to say thanks very much. I really lo love the residency and I I'm going to carry on thinking and weaving this idea of um, how we can see inconvenience as a positive into my future work. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, can I ask you to um, reflect on the role of technology in your art practice in general? Because obviously, uh, this is one of many types of engagements with technology that you've had. Uh, what have you done here that, you know, is either, you know, building on top of existing work or completely new to you? And how did you take that on board as an artist? So it's new. The whole NFT thing was new. I think I often work with data as an art material. That's been my kind of a, a constant theme in my practice for probably about 20 years. And um, I've been increasingly, I've been increasingly thinking about why, about the impact of data and the environmental impact of data, particularly the duplication of data. And it's a, ma it's a massive problem, the amount of duplication of things. I mean, even to, if you imagine that, um, a company that's got 10,000 employees and they've all got about five copies of the PowerPoint, at least. Imagine how many random slides are just hanging around that are sort of duplicated data. And this kind of like, it's that the obesity and the pollution of data on the internet is a massive problem. So I've kind of, I'm passionate about data, but I, I'm beginning to kind of step back and view it in a slightly different way. And I think that's part of a movement that that everyone that deals with data should start thinking about. Do we really need to collect it? And why are we collecting? Are we just collecting it so we can make things more convenient? Maybe we should stop doing that as well. Um, so it's really has swerved my practice, I think, this, this past four weeks. Wonderful. I'll take that under uh, in, my, uh, in my sleep tonight as I uh, <laughs> close. Um, this particular afternoon, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, who has stayed on this call this whole time. I'm just going to share my screen once more 
to let you capture everyone's names. Again, I really want to make an emphasis and put an emphasis on these residents um, that have taken the time these four weeks to reflect, to respond. Hopefully some of the responses that you've seen uh, today you've enjoyed. Uh, please follow them on the social media um, links that they prefer, which uh, are all at the bottom of each project page that they've shared with me and that are all on the website. Um, the next steps for uh, LOCTI, which is what I like to call Low Carbon Design Institute uh, as a series of activities, are uh, Friday reading clubs that will resume and Damon, uh, who has been uh, uh, listening in, has been a uh, a fervent uh, participant in um, and this is just an opportunity on Fridays to collectively read a long read together and then discuss it uh, so those will resume as of next week um, and the June 2022 uh, applications are now open on the website uh, so please either if you've enjoyed your time on this residency or you've enjoyed what you've seen today uh, please send applicants uh, my way uh, and again, I want to uh, thank the sponsors that have uh, uh, covered some of the costs of the talks, Ben Terrett, Matt Jones, and Something More Near, an agency based in London, who have just, uh, in fact, redesigned their website, which was announced this morning, uh, in, for it to be a lower carbon website. So I'm going to stop the recording now and just let people mingle if they want to, hang out if they want to, and just talk to each other.